So the next next elevator pitch will be given by Hong, and he will talk about data-driven mirror descent. Thank you. Well, thanks, Randolph, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. So I'll make this quite quick. Uh, I'll be talking about data-driven mirror descent today. So the motivation for this is optimization in practice. So the typical ex example that you want to be thinking about would be variational regularization. For example, in uh, image processing or signal processing, where the reconstruction is given by the minimizer to some functional. So in this sense, the quality of your reconstruction is directly correlated to how quickly you can optimize said functional. So that's sort of motivation to optimize something faster. And to do this, we have this sort of heuristic in mind where maybe if we restrict our problem set, maybe from all CT images to only brain CT images, maybe there's some sort of structure in, in this function class that would allow us to have better optimization. Um, Generally, this is part of a larger field called learning to optimize. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. You learn how to optimize some particular function class faster. And there's two main paradigms for this. The first one is using neural networks, where you take in your previous iterates, maybe the gradient, and it spits out an update step. And there's another paradigm, which is to base it on top of a classical optimization scheme, such as PDHG, or like forward backward splitting. And you essentially learn some, some parameters. And the method that we'll be proposing in this talk today is combining these two. So we'll have a neural network based functional parameterization well, based on some classical optimization scheme, which is mirror descent. So quick background, uh, we'll be working on convex optimization in this case. Uh, this is just your standard gradient descent step. You subtract the gradient, but actually you can't do that because the gradient's in the dual space. You can't, you can't really do that. You can't subtract something from the dual space from something in a primal space. So what we do is we have a mirror map which maps between the primal and the dual space, and this gives us mirror descent. Essentially what we're doing here is we have our theta to map the iterate to the dual space, and then we do the gradient step there. Uh, here's a nice picture, not by me, but yeah, so you have your iterate, you map it over, you do your gradient step, and then you map it back, and that's a mirror descent iteration. So in classical literature, uh, this mirror map is given by the gradient of some strongly convex function. Uh, and this is usually done to ensure injectivity, which is, well, half of bijectivity. Um, this actually also allows us to have a closed form inverse for the gradient. So in this case, it's actually just the gradient of the convex conjugate of psi, which is just another convex function. Um, this also will aid us in parameterization later. Uh, we can see here heuristically the effect of mirror descent. We have this Bregman distance, which is just some sort of distance induced by the convex, uh, the convex map psi that replaces this, this squared L2 distance. So it's imposing some sort of distance that's not the Euclidean distance onto your optimization. So just a quick example, uh, least squares, well, the solution to this is just W inverse B, assuming W is full rank. And the idea that we want is to have our optimization to go directly from the iterate to the minimizer, which is W inverse B. So if we look at the gradient, it looks sort of like that. We have this X minus W inverse B, which is pretty good, but then you have this pretty annoying W transpose W in front, but it's actually linear, it's not that bad. We can just apply mirror descent. Uh, instead of having the identity here, which would correspond to well, just normal gradient descent, we have this extra W transpose W coming out, and just trust me, if you use mirror descent like this, then you have your mirror descent update, which looks like this, and we can see that the update points directly towards the minimizer, which is what we want. So this in some case, in some sense, it's optimal, let's say. So that's the classical scheme. How do we make it learned? Well, there's only a couple things we can learn here. Uh, mainly, it's this mirror map psi. 
So what we do is we replace that by a neural network and theta. And normally for like a deep neural network, we don't have an exact closed form of the convex conjugate. So what we'll also do here is we'll parameterize the convex conjugate with another neural network, m theta star, which is not exactly the, the inverse of this guy. And we'll also learn the step sizes, just because we can. So the goal here is to learn some maps that would allow us to optimize something faster, while also heuristically keeping uh, our mirror maps. So this one is the forward mirror map and the backward mirror map uh, to be approximate inverses of each other. So there's really only two things that we need. We need that our m theta, which is modeling psi, to be convex. And we can do this quite simply just by considering the architecture. There's something called an input convex neural network. It's not that difficult. If you have a feed-forward neural network and you have some very light conditions on the weights and activations, then you can guarantee that your neural network is convex in its input. And we also have some convergence guarantees. So here, slightly informally, we can see the effect of uh, keeping the mirror maps close to each other. So as long as it's sufficiently close to each other, then we can get big O of 1 over k convergence plus this constant m, which depends on basically how big this guy is. So as long as your inverses are close to each other, we can get convergence up to some constant. So to train this, uh, we've got two goals here. The first one is just to minimize things as quickly as possible, as in learning to optimize. And the second one, to maintain our theoretical guarantees, we want to minimize this forward-backward inconsistency just to maintain that these two are indeed inverses of each other. And that's reflected in equation three. You have this guy, which is the objective iterate, or the objective value at each iterate. And then you have this guy, which is sort of difference between uh, of these two maps from being inverses of each other. So back to our example, we have least squares. Uh, I fixed our w to be this guy, which is full rank. And in this case, we know exactly what our optimal mirror map should be. It should be of this quadratic form, this w transpose w. And for simplicity, in this case, let's just make our mirror maps this quadratic form. So we're trying to train our weight matrix A to optimize functions of this form as quickly as possible. And well, we know what this is for the case where the i is the identity. It's just gradient descent. So let's see what happens. Wow, it works. So we have this blue line down here. This is learned mirror descent with well, the aforementioned weight matrix here. And we also learn the step sizes. So and with these purple lines, this is learned mirror descent with the learned weight matrix, but without learned step sizes. So we just plug in the constant step size. We can see it does very well. It does better than Adam, which is not very good for, con for quadratic problems, and definitely does much better than gradient descent. Um, I've slightly misleadingly put this cyan M mirror descent line here. Um, it's only up here because the step sizes are really small. But theoretically, you should get linear convergence, which sort of looks like this purple line. Um, on the right here, we can also see uh, in an image what the mirror map is doing. We can see it's sort of very curvy in this direction and not super curvy in this direction. Uh, this corresponds to the eigenvalues of W. So here it's like three and here it's like one. So it, it makes sense. The quadratic form makes sense. And uh, we can actually also see here, it's quite difficult to see, but this is, it is actually almost proportional to W transpose W. The ratios are like, seven, nine, something like that. So it is learning the optimal mirror map. Uh, we can also do this for PV model-based in-painting. So this is a variational regularization method for in-painting an image. Uh, I'm not sure what that is. I'll show you in the next slide. But again, uh, learn mirror descent does quite well. We have, we have this blue. And then it just sort of goes up a little bit because we're trying to extend the learned step sizes. But in general, it does, again, very well. Uh, we can see the effect of the step sizes with uh, different asymptotic uh, constant convergence. And it does better than, well, gradient descent and atom, again. So seems to work well.
um, just to make sure it is actually doing what we want it to do. So on the left, we have our masked image. The in-painting problem is to paint in the missing pixels, and we do that while enforcing approximate piecewise linearity, which is given by the TV regularization. In the middle, we have the learned mirror descent reconstruction, which is our method. And on the right, we have this sort of atom-based reconstruction. We can actually see, well, probably, that uh, the learned mirror descent reconstruction does look slightly better than the atom one. There's less like artifacting in this general area, like this, this bit looks generally more piecewise linear, so that's good. So it works, basically. So just to conclude, mirror descent, we can exploit the problem geometry to get faster optimization, and we can do this in a way where we can just automatically learn the problem geometry, as given here. Um, and we can also do this in a fashion that allows us to have approximate convergence bounds up to this constant. So yeah, a couple outlooks experimentally if we have an exact convex conjugate to a deep neural network, that would be quite good. And maybe more theoretically for the geometers, for a given function class, what sort of optimal mirror map would look like and whether or not neural network would be able to approximate this well. So. Yeah, that's the end of my pitch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hong. Yep. You, you showed how the method worked with a random mask. How does it work when it's got a more structured sort of adversarial mask? Adversarial mask. Oh, when where you showed the pictures, that, that was on the next, one. it's more random. If you've got a structured type of mask, what, what happens to the formulation? Um, that is well, to, be, to be explored, I suppose. But you think it would look something like this as well. Um, yeah, because it's, it's simply a convex optimization task, right? So in this case, we have, we're trying to minimize the sort of TV reconstruction loss with this specific mask. But if you have a structured mask as well, then it would be pretty much the same thing. Yeah. It'd be good if it was could do that. Mm. Yes. So that would correspond to a different class of optimization or convex optimization problems. So uh, the class here would be minimizing for, for some fixed Z. We minimize over like masked images Y. So the function class would be of this form, but with different y, which corresponds to well, images like this in, in some image data set, basically. So if you change your mask, you would be changing your function class, and you would have to relearn. But actually, uh, in some future experiments, we do see that we can change the forward operator a little bit from the identity to, say, convolutions. And it still seems to work pretty well. So it suggests that maybe it's inherent to uh, the data class itself like of the images. Okay, so then let's thank Hong again. <laughs>